Hi, I'm Leanne Ely. I'm a nutritionist, a New York Times bestselling author, and some people even say I'm a life coach. I started The Daily Dish Show to share my story, my truth, and my journey to vibrancy, and to inspire others to do the same. Because it's all about grit, perseverance, and finding a way despite the odds. It's about embracing the whole woman, not just the parts that are easy to love, and feeding her heart, mind, body, and soul. But I found that this isn't just my story, it's your story too. It's go time. This is The Daily Dish. So we're talking today about skills. You know, I, I really want to talk about skills because, you know, we we always say, yeah, just do this and get yourself into that and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's all well and good. But how do you develop skills, for heaven's sakes? We think of a concert pianist and a whole that's a skill, right? That is a skill. It's an art form. It is talent. It is beautiful. It's all the things. Um, people who sing, um, art artists, we think about people who have done um, in Japan. If, if you're a sushi chef, that's going to take you years and years of learning as well. Well, Tim Ferriss, um, like I said, he's an author. And if you can look him up, it's Ferris, F-E-R-R-I-S-S. Tim Ferriss, um, but burst into the scene probably, uh, I want to say, early 2000s, um, called the Four Day Work Week, and it's basically how he is able to ferret his uh, his work into just four days and how he he does it. I mean, everybody read it who was an, in an online business um, many years ago, and it was just like, oh yeah, this guy's like amazing. He's making money while he sleeps and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Or, um, you know, laptop, kind of a laptop lifestyle. Go anywhere you want. As long as he had an internet connection. Well, that's pretty commonplace now. But the whole point of it is, is that, you know, skill set is, is a lot. But we can also learn a multitude of skills that we need to serve us, to help us, and to help others easily and quickly because it doesn't have to take as long as it as everyone thinks and this is why Tim Ferriss did he did 13 different experiments he called it the Tim Ferriss experiment I think he even had a tv show or did a special or a documentary on it or whatever and listen some of the things that he did that supposedly takes a lifetime jujitsu race car driving poker tournament level poker um, learn Tagalog. I don't know how hard that is to learn, but apparently it is. And drumming. Now, he took these skills, each one of them. He said, I'm going to learn how to drum. I'm going to learn how to do jujitsu. I'm going to learn how to play poker. He took five days. He had a master, of course, teaching him. Like when he was surfing, he had, uh, I can't remember his last name is Laird, though, L-A-I-R-D, who's like, you know, a, a champion surfer. So he had the best of the best of the best teaching him. He took himself five days. After five days of jujitsu, for example, he went into the ring in a packed stadium and took on somebody who has been doing this his whole life, pretty much. Um, he did the same thing with race car driving and, and, and drove a race car. He did. He went into a poker tournament, poker tournament, with hundreds of thousands of his own dollars and played in this poker tournament. And I don't know what the, I don't know what the result of that was. I hadn't gone that far and looked it all up, but I just thought it was interesting. He also had it the drummer from the police. Remember the band, the police taught him how to do, um, how to do the drums, how to, how to play the drums. After five days, he convinced foreigner, the band foreigner, which, you know, 80s, love, love. <laughs> he taught, he convinced them to let him play with them at a concert, not just play in rehearsal or something like that, but play with them in concert. Wow, pretty, pr pretty exciting, isn't it? Anyway, the thing is that he had mastered enough skill in some of these different areas so that they said yes. So that the, the jujitsu guy that he was training with said yes. So that 
he was able to get into a race car and, and ra actually race. So he was able to sit in a poker tournament with hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, at, on the line and, and play with these master players, you know, in five days. Now that might be extreme for all of us, but I think it just shows and illustrates that how our wanting to learn and the application and being able to put some, the way he unpacked learning, um, it just blows up this whole notion that it takes a lifetime to learn different skills. Not necessarily, not necessarily. It might take a lifetime for mastery, but it doesn't take a lifetime to learn certain skills, okay? Let's talk about what that is. He said, it, this is Tim Ferriss's things, when he was looking at this, what he noticed was the commonality in every single one of these things that he was trying to do. And the first one was, the first one was, was mastering fear, of course. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, if you said to me in five days, in five days, you're going to be in a jujitsu ring with some chick who's, you know, mastered this all of her life. What are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what Tim Ferriss did. He used the um, Pardo principle. Have you heard of that? The 80-20 rule. And that's basically that 20%. What is it? That 80% of what you do is from 20% of what you learn. So he learned one stealth move. It was like called the guillotine choke or something. That's all he did. And he was able to win a few matches and he was able to get that because that covered 80% of what he needed to do. <laughs> Interesting, right? Um, so mastering fear. So being able to master one little portion, not the whole thing. Just think what we can learn in the seven days of the sprint, says Sarah. Absolutely. Hey there, Flynn. Yeah, absolutely. You see, when we're open for learning, when we're open for business, so to speak, and learning about skills, what can I do? Did you see when Grace um, put, had the whole thing on Sunday? This is what I do to get ready for, you know, my, for my sprint. And she had everything laid out. Did you see that? She had her little containers together. She had, you know, she was getting, doing a Sunday, basically uh, menu planning and preparation. So that everything was ready to go. What, what, what's that? That's mastering the fear that this is too hard. That's mastering the fear that I got everything that I need. It's mastering the fear of will I be able to do this because it's all set up and ready to go. Fantastic stuff, right? This is what we need to do. We learn skills so that we can do this. And if you don't know how, well, my goodness, you know, this is a simple and easy thing to do. You deconstruct the whole thing. And that's part of, um, that's number two is what do you do to in learn order to do this in order to take overwhelm out in order to be able to understand what to do? Well, you deconstruct it, you break it down into individual components, you chunk it out. That's what the sprint is all about. So if you do that, like sort with the sprint, let's, let's just use that as an example. What, do, what does that mean? Do you have the water bottles that you need in your cupboard already? Get them because that's going to be part of your hydration station. So pull those out. You've got your water source and everything. There you go. There you go. There's one. That's deconstruction number one. Number two, four-minute workout. Go to YouTube. Learn how to do it. Got it. Next. What else do I need to do? Go make some bone broth, you know, or buy it. Who cares? You know, get your groceries. Do all of that. Get prepared. Do all of the things. Because I'm going to tell you right now, um, mastery is you don't need mastering it. You just need to accomplish a couple of things. You need to deconstruct it, put this whole plan out and into the place so that you can get it done. That simple, that simple. Mastery of the fear of failing like you did in the past. Yeah, of course, of course. And you know what? We get out of that fear of failing when we start to understand that it, it's just, all I need to do is understand this one thing. Get this hydration station going and we're good to go. All I have to do is get this one thing, get, get my supplements all put into the little supplement containers or whatever for, for the week. Easy. You know, get the little things that you need, do the little things that you need to do, and then watch how much easier everything becomes. Because when we just deconstruct it, when we break it down into individual components, there's nothing to be overwhelmed about. It's just doing this one thing. And if you read the plan, you know, I might actually say again, if you print it out and read it and pencil it and 
go through it and understand it, then it really becomes your own. And this is what we need to do with everything, any kind of skill that we're trying to learn. Oh my goodness, Amazon has a subscribe and save option for Kettle and Fire six pack of bone broth. That's awesome. Then number three is you gotta find your 20%. Remember what I said, the part of principle, 80% of your results stem from 20% of your actions. That's what was done with the jujitsu, the guillotine choke, whatever that is. I don't think I want to know what that is, you know, but it's true. Have you noticed that, that what you work the hardest on and everything, and, and I would say that it's true with, in, in my business, you know, we, out of a hundred percent of our customers, 20% of them are really active in doing things. Same thing in our um, hot milk sprint group. Go look in there, you know? Not snacking is your 20%. That's a good one, Sarah. <laughs> it's a, isn't that a good one to learn, though? But that's how it is. 80%. If you really apply your, you know, put in the effort at least 20% um, for the 20%, it, the 80% follows. It's just that simple. Number four is mastery goes beyond the 80-20, but for most things, this will work. Now, Sarah, you'll love this one. So um, this guy, Stephen Kotler, has a book. Um, he had the book called, um, what was it called? The Rise of Superman. Yeah, really good book. And one of the things that he said in there, you know, he said for the 80-20 rule, he said, I need to understand legalese because for some of the clients that he was dealing with and what have you, and, you know, he needed to understand legalese. He's not a lawyer. He said, so the 80-20 rule for me is good enough so I could understand the legalese. He said, however, if I'm going to hire a lawyer, I want them to have mastery. Amen? So same here. You know, I mean, if, if you want me to coach you, which I'm not coaching clients right now, but if you wanted me to coach you, you would want, you know, somebody who has understood and, you know, has the background that I have and the years that I have and, and what have you. You're looking for that kind of expertise. You're not just looking for a book. You know, you're looking for expertise. Mastery comes in different forms and we don't have to, and this is the truth, master absolutely everything. We just need to get good enough and then even excellent and just a few things because that's the needle mover. How about that? Have you ever given yourself that kind of grace? Have you ever said it's okay? You don't have to be perfect because that's what, you know, mastery, mastery is great, but getting it really, get, getting really good is excellent. You know, mastery isn't perfection, but I think oftentimes we confuse perfection with mastery. So, you know, just, just, these are just my thoughts of this whole thing and just how this all fits in because oftentimes it's this idea of mastery, this idea of everything having to be in a row and everything having to be perfect that stops us from even doing the smallest thing so that we can have success in the smallest things like the sprint, seven days. Number five is grit what's what keeps you going. Did you know that? Not quitting. And this is how we train the overwhelm out because here's the thing. We're always going to be overwhelmed with something that's brand new. Always. Do you remember? Um, I, I don't know how many of you did this, but I remember homemaking and I remember sewing and sewing with my mom and learning how to sew. And, you know, the bias of the fabric and laying down the pattern and having to cut it out and, you know, doing it right versus whatever. It, it was an overwhelming experience. Who did I need to be perfect at this? I just wanted it done. I was trying to make a summer dress, you know, and so I got the summer dress done, you know, and I did it sort of my way and it wasn't really well done if you looked on the inside of it, but it was good enough. It got the job done. And then my eighth grade um, <laughs> home ec teacher, I'll never forget her, Miss Davis. She had a mustache, by the way. And she looked at me with her cigarette breath and said, what's this with the gym bag? Because I was like, Good enough. Get it done. It looked fine, but she turned it inside out and gave me a C minus. And you know what's interesting is that when we do this to our children, when you do it, to, that that was it. I was done sewing. I said, I'm not sewing again. If somebody's going to grade me on that, it was good enough. You know, I wasn't there to master sewing. I was there to make something. And that's good enough. 
that's good enough. That's actually even excellent, but not from a seamstress point of view. So, you know, again, you got to figure out what it is that you want to do. And also, may I just say to all of you parents and grandparents out there, be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Don't don't necessarily need to turn everything inside out and, and then grade it like that. We want to encourage. We don't want to uh, make people say no. So I thought that was really interesting, um, that whole thing. So he learned some lessons. So these are Tim's lessons that he learned along the way that I thought were good, really good stuff. There are two parts to self-improvement. The first one, of course, is achievement. Yeah, don't we all like a little achievement? It makes us feel good, you know, high five, the whole bit. And he said, you know, but oftentimes what happens with people who are in self-improvement and they're just going the extra mile, they're working themselves to the bone, they're just, they're crazy, um, excelling at everything that they do. And they're left empty and it's constantly seeking and something's amiss. And it was really interesting what he said. And it's, he said it's because the other 50% should be gratitude. Gratitude. This is how we stoke the fire of well-being, by the way. Gratitude gives us that opportunity to, to not isolate, to not stay apart, for, uh, away from, to not be, you know, just saying that I'm not good enough. Gratitude won't allow you to do that. Gratitude says, look, open your eyes and see all that you have. Gratitude opens up our beautiful selves and helps us to see things better, doesn't it? I think that's an important thing because with all this emphasis on achievement, I mean, look at look at little Simon uh, Simone Biles, right? With all this emphasis on achievement and taking our eyes off, it, I read the article, she said she had the twisties. Do you know what that is? She couldn't, if you have the twisties, you lose your bearing and you don't trust your body. And that's how you have a really serious accident. We all have that. We all have the twisties in some part, don't we? We all have it where we don't quite trust ourselves. We don't quite feel this. So if, if it's all about achievement, we can't be in the place of, of the enjoyment. And gratitude stokes enjoyment. Gratitude feeds enjoyment. Gratitude gives us an opportunity to have happiness and love and joy in our life and not be isolated unto achievement. So number two is you got to work on just a few things at a time, because here's the thing. If we work on everything at one time and we're just like balancing, you remember I've, I've used this before. My mother used to say that I was like on Ed Sullivan. If anybody remembers the Ed Sullivan show, they always had, you know, some kind of almost circus act. And she said, you're the, you're the guy who's got the plates going on the sticks. And this guy would start the stick with the plate going and then, then another, and he'd start the other, then he'd get back and get the thing going and da da da. And you just sit there, you know, absolutely glued to the television, hoping none of the plates, none of the plates would, would land on the floor. But my mother used to say, that's you, Leanne. And, and it's true. I was, I absolutely a hundred percent, um, prided myself on the ability to multitask. And the problem was nothing really got done well. It just got through. And, and, and I don't mean, you know, it's like the gym bag or whatever. You don't have to have everything perfect for sure. It just needs, sometimes things just need to be done. I don't know about you, but I don't grade my toilet cleaning. I don't go, well, that was a C minus job. I know I just get in there and just, you know, it's done. <laughs> it's done. As a matter of fact, just a hint from me, you know, because I do it every morning, you know, just to keep everything thick and span. I also um, I also use a, a Kleenex to wipe the, the rim. Then I don't have to use an icky cloth and wash it. I can flush it. Boom. Done. You know, it's it, it just needs to get done. I don't need to grade that. There are things in our lives that we don't need to grade and there are things in our lives that we just need to get through with. And then there are things that we really want to be put extreme care into and, and love into and enjoyment. And wouldn't it be nice and wouldn't it be wonderful if it were our relationships and it were, it were our, you know, with our children and with our spouses and, and all of that. What if we did that? We don't, we get overwhelmed when we try to spin all the plates. 
And we've proven over and over again that those plates fall and break and it's a big mess. And then we've got the cleanup. We don't need to do that anymore. We just take on a couple of things and stay away from the overwhelm place. That overwhelm, you know, mountain is, uh, it is waiting for the avalanche. It's waiting for you to just take one more thing on. So evaluate where you are and just work on a couple of things at a time and, and put your effort into things that make you feel good. I, I, there's nothing wrong with feeling good, by the way. We shouldn't always feel like everything is, an, is a massive effort and everything is work. And, you know, I, I think it's nice to feel good about what you're doing and, and have a little bit of enjoyment in there. Number three is that when you are in the weeds with your projects or your goals, put timelines on them. That's really important. Without a timeline, you know, you you just have, I've, I've seen this thing before, you have a hobby or a jobby, you know, kind of a thing. Without, if you're not going to really make it happen, like for people who are trying to start a business, you got to do things and you got to get it done in time and you got to have things happen. Otherwise, it's not a real deal. And that's how this whole thing works. So we have to timeline things. You know, we got a, we've got a book coming out, right? That's on a timeline. And uh, my, my timeline is, has been extended. <laughs> but on Saturday, that thing is getting delivered and being put out. Well, there's also going to be a workbook that goes with it. So lots of stuff coming up with it. But, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, timelines are our saviors. And I don't know about you, but I need a timeline. Without a timeline, I'm just, I'm going to just, you know, it's, it's like a boat without an anchor. We need that. It anchors us and keeps us from falling away from it. It also helps to get the job done. Number four, when you lack motivation, use incentives or punishments. You never thought I'd say that, did you? <laughs> there is this website called stick, S-T-I-C-K-K.com. And if you're having a hard time and if you are incentive driven, you might want to go over there and put down 10 bucks or 50 bucks or however much it is and say, I'm going to lose X amount of weight in X amount of time. And you have to, I, I don't know all the, the details about it. I saw it a long time ago. I haven't looked at it in a long, in a while, but the whole idea behind this, this thing is that you're, you're betting with a bunch of people. You have the ability to win a whole bunch of money. If incentivizing something works for you. I did this a long time ago. I was uh, married at the time and um, I was trying to lose postpartum weight. And uh, I remember saying to my husband, I'm just going to get this on. And he goes, I'll give you a thousand bucks to, to go. It, you know, I was not working at the time. So, you know, I was like, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I'll give you a thousand bucks if you, you know, you get it off, you know, you can get back into your old clothes and whatever. I took them on and I did it. I was incentivized by that. But there's other people who are incentivized or not incentivized by that at all. They're, they're more, um, per, they're pushed more by punishment. I don't understand that, but it, it's true. It's a different type of personality. So if you say, oh, that's just terrible. It's just awful. Well, that's just not you either. Uh, you're, you're more, most of us are more into the incentive, incentivization, if you will. But there are, there's a small fraction of people out there. I have a good friend of mine, her name's Jenny, not this Jenny, uh, a good friend of mine named Jenny, who she is incentivized by punishment. So she'll say something like, if I don't get this done, um, then I, I am going to give, and she'll make loud proclamation. She'll put it on Facebook. I'm going to give $500 or $1,000 to some horrible charity, you know, like some white supremacist Nazi, you know, thing, <laughs> money to this charity. So I have got to get it done. That is, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But, and of course she always makes her deadline when she does that, but she, makes herself accountable. She puts it out there and she says, this, this is my punishment if I don't do it right. Goes against every grain of her being. But you see how that, that would be her motivation. I don't get it, but that's her. And that some of the population is like that. Number five is diversify your identity. You know, you're not just a mom or a wife or a career gal or a lawyer or, you know, whatever you're not you are also a woman a lover of god a daughter of a king you're a dear friend 
you know, you are a soul, you are a being, you are here on purpose and for purpose. And start seeing that about yourself. Start seeing the purposefulness in who you are and being here. It's not just about your role. It's not about just what you can do and the bacon that you can bring home and put in the pan and cook it up yourself. And remember that song? Love that about yourself. Because when we start to love ourselves for who we are and whose we are, we start to see ourselves in a very different light. We can do things. You know, we don't need to spin plates. We don't need to put ourselves out there and and be the be the be all end all. We don't have to identify with just the busyness of who we are. We can identify with the soul of who we are and how we connect that way. <laughs> Vanessa says, I'll take the thousand dollar motivation. So these are all Tim's lessons from understanding about skill. And these are all skills. And there's takeaways from those skills. So as we go into this week, this next week and on Monday, as we get ready to start these challenges, I'm going to really ask you to dig deep, dig deep into the skills and be focused on the things that you need to be focused on. Allow the things that don't need to be, you have so much focus, allow one of those plates to come down off the stick and be stacked. Yeah, it doesn't need to come crashing down. And give yourself the opportunity to become and to be the very best that you can be, the most excellent that you can be. Identify yourself as who you belong to and not so much all the roles that you handle. When we see ourselves in the eyes in which God sees us and he see, sees us, he says that we are the apple of his eye. That's pretty astounding. And we understand that we're here on purpose and for purpose and that we have all these different things going on, don't think for a minute that he doesn't care about those details and he doesn't care about your weight or he doesn't care about your anything. He cares about all of it. He cares about what you care about. And as we get into all of this and we start understanding that our skills are important, but so is our being, then we can rest in that and stop pushing quite so hard and start resting in the greatness of not just achievement, but also gratitude for what we have. What do you think of that? I think that's helpful. That's what I think. Well, tomorrow, I promise, will be recorded, okay? And I might, the Friday surprise that I have will not be there tomorrow. It'll be here next Friday, okay? Take it easy. I will see you then uh, tomorrow anyway, and I'll see you live uh, for Soulful Saturday. Peace be with you. Thank you for joining me today. You can find me on TikTok for daily tips to help support your most vibrant life. And remember, you are the author of your own story. Until next time.